Welcome to the Future of the Corporation Purpose Summit, Purposeful Business in Times of Crisis. My name is Hitan Shah. I'm Chief Executive of the British Academy. I'm delighted to introduce the opening session on how businesses adopt around the world. And as governments, business leaders and investors start to rebuild from the crisis, this is a unique opportunity to steer towards a more sustainable and equitable economy and society. And a key part of that will be through reconceptualization of the corporation around purpose. The British Academy's Future of the Corporation program represents a comprehensive attempt to develop a new contract between business and society. We're aiming to contribute research and expertise towards a paradigm shift, redefining business in the 21st century. And a core part of that is thinking about purpose as a lens by which business can respond to a range of issues. And over the coming few days, we'll be considering what those issues are uh, that, that business is, is thinking about right now. Up till now, we at the British Academy have published 17 research papers from 40 leading academics, convened over 1,500 business leaders, policymakers, and academics through roundtables, workshops, and briefings, and so on. And this is the first of a, major, a series of major events over the next 12 months. Before we begin today's event, I'd like to thank our supporters and corporate partners who've made this project possible. In particular, our principal supporters, the Society of the Advancement of Management Studies and the Immersi Foundation, who've been with us for the beginning. Today, we're gonna to hear a range of really exciting speakers with a brief session at the end for questions. You as listeners can use the Slido app below the live stream to propose questions and vote for your favorites. There'll also be a live scribe of the session, which will be fascinating to see. And please do tweet. You can use the hashtag Purpose Summit uh, and tag in at British Academy, as well as many of the speakers. So uh, I'm now going to hand over to Professor Colin Mayer, who's been the academic lead of the program, to introduce the principles for purposeful bus business. Heaton, thank you very much indeed. Uh, as you just mentioned, the Future of the Corporation program has put corporate purpose at the heart of what it's looking at. And these summits are not really designed to discuss the question of whether or why one should be putting purpose at the heart, but really to get straight to the heart of the matter. And that is what and how. What is corporate purpose? and how should business embed it in the heart of what it's doing. Now, the program has put forward a set of proposals as to what uh, should be done in terms of trying to achieve that, eight principles. And our eight principles are around a clear notion of what corporate purpose is, namely, it's about solving problems, solving problems that we face as individuals, societies, and the natural world, and to do it in a profitable and commercial way. So we define corporate purpose as being to produce profitable solutions to the problems of people and planet, and not to profit from producing problems for either. Now those eight principles, which we suggest should underpin it, are on law and regulation, ownership and governance, measurement and performance, and finance and investment. What we want to do from these sessions is to establish the way in which business is going to do this, what problems they're going to encounter in the process, and how they're going to address those, and how they're going to demonstrate that they've delivered on their corporate purpose. In particular, we want to establish or pursue the idea that corporate purpose is a way of solving problems in a commercial fashion that provides a powerful and practical way of addressing the challenges we currently face. The focus of these particular panels is predominantly but not exclusively on large corporations that's not because we necessarily believe that they're the best way of taking this forward, but because they are so important, influential, and difficult to change. The challenge they pose are particularly great in this respect. We'll be hearing in the summit from other organizations and people from the public sector, government, 
private sector, from smaller as well as large companies and from other types of organizations. They'll in particular be the focus of future summits that we'll be holding during the course of this and next year. So too will a whole series of emerging issues. The pandemic, health, social, diversity issues have joined climate change as immediate concerns to place the S as well as the E of ESG, environmental, social, and governance in the spotlight. And there'll be others, and we'll respond by demonstrating how purposeful companies provide a powerful way of helping the world to resolve them. At the end of the last session, I'll be saying a little bit about our plans for future summits. But for today, I've laid down the gauntlet to our panelists to rise to the challenge of establishing what and whose problems business is capable of addressing, how they intend to set about doing it, what help they will need from government and elsewhere in delivering it, and how they will demonstrate that they have done it. It will be for you watching the sessions and posing challenging questions to judge whether and which businesses, politicians, and policymakers you believe will credibly help solve the problems we face. Back to you, Ida. I'm pleased to now introduce uh, Stefan Oshman, who is the chair of the executive board and CEO of Merck. Uh, Stefan, could you tell us a bit about what the purpose agenda means in practice in a pharmaceutical company? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ida. And I'm honored to join you for this, this extraordinary summit during extraordinary at times. Just one word, we are a company that has three businesses. One is bio, biopharma, the second one is life science, and the third one is, is performance materials. Are you okay with the audio? Can you hear me well? Okay, thank you. So uh, in, in this context, I'd like to begin with a quote. A quote is, the endeavor of my company is always to support scientific research in every possible way. And I think that's a strong sense, a strong statement of purpose. And what I find most striking about that is the age of that statement. Willie Mack wrote it to a man named Otto Lehmann back in 1905. So 115 years ago, one of our family partners explained to a pioneer in the field of liquid crystals what MAG is all about. Back then, nobody was sure if Otto Lehmann's research would ever lead to meaningful applications. And today, liquid crystal displays are everywhere. And to me, this is a strong example of how a deep-rooted purpose helps company to, companies to identify potential they might only realize in a distant future. In the case of MAC, we can now look back at 352 years of innovation. And the wording of our purpose today shows that the future is still what we are all about. Our purpose statement is we are curious minds dedicated to human progress. And I believe that ideally, a company's purpose is where its employees' intrinsic motivation overlaps with its business goals. And when this is the case, it can be a powerful catalyst for performance. And in my experience, it is not enough to put them some posters with catchy slogans to tap this potential. It is crucial that you actually walk the talk. And let me give you an idea of how we walk the talk when it comes to the main aspects of our purpose, curiosity and progress. MAC is a science and technology company, and curiosity is what drives our people, especially in our labs. In fact, they work hard every day to improve the lives of millions of people. Just a few examples. We develop treatments against serious diseases such as cancer or multiple sclerosis. We provide scientists and biotech companies with cutting edge tools and technologies, for example, to develop medical therapies and vaccines. And not least, we push the development of high-tech materials, those that enable the production of ever faster, smaller, and more energy-saving microchips, for example. At MAC, we believe this is a day 
and an age that offers great potential to overcome many of the challenges we face today, whether climate change, access to health, or food for a growing global population. Yet, simply appealing to people's restraint is not enough. I believe science and technology are the key to a viable and prosperous future. At the same time, we don't believe that we should do everything we can do. After all, some of our technologies touch on the very fundamentals of what it means to be a human being. Just think of biotechnological tools such as genome editing. Accordingly, our concept of progress is closely linked to one of our company values, namely responsibility. This is why a decade ago, we created our own bioethics advisory panel. Its members are international experts in bioethics, theology, science, and law. The panel gives clear guidance on bioethical issues to steer our behavior and our entrepreneurial conduct. We also feel an obligation to use our capabilities beyond our business. For example, we are collab collaborating with the World Health Organization to elim eliminate the parasitic worm disease, schistosomiasis, which claims around 200,000 lives every year. And we've decided to find more holistic ways to evaluate the progress of our business development. This is why we have started to introduce sustainable business value as a new method to assess the societal and environmental impact of our activities. We are curious minds dedicated to human progress. And as you can see, we, we take our purpose very, very seriously. As a consequence, we won't stick to this ideal in spite of the current crisis. On the contrary to us, the crisis has confirmed that our purpose is a beacon showing us our way into the future. I was uh, so touched and moved by talking to so many of our employees during these crisis days through digital means. I'm deeply convinced that the role of senior management is not to motivate people, it's rather not to demotivate people, i.e. select the right people, develop the right people, and create a work environment that is conducive to success. And then if a sense of purpose come on top of this, comes on top of this, such as especially expressed during this uh, crisis, an organization can achieve levels of performance that one has never seen before. We're working very, very closely with the global community at uh, fighting the COVID-19 crisis. So just a couple of examples, we're donating drugs to support the World Health Organization's search for therapies against COVID-19. We're collaborating with the Jenner Institute at uh, Oxford, among others, to scale up the manufacturing of a possible vaccine. And last year, we, actually la mid of last year, we awarded our Future Insight Prize with a grant of 1 million euros to two scientists who work on fighting and containing pandemics. Back then, no one knew that such an outbreak would happen now, but Hardy Sabeti of Harvard University and James Crow of Vanderbilt University Medical Center need the grant today more than ever. Personally, I believe that genuine curiosity and a responsible definition of progress can be guidelines for all of us in dealing with the pandemic or any crisis for that matter. Science and collaboration driven by a strong purpose might be mankind's most powerful tools. COVID-19 is a striking example of how various disciplines, both in the sciences and the humanities, need to develop curiosity for their respective findings in order to create real progress in society's battle against the virus. And I believe we all need to foster our own curiosity to try and truly understand the medical, societal, and economic impact of what we are seeing right now. To me, these extraordinary times have shown that great challenges can truly bring out the best in people. At MAG and far beyond, I'm seeing a sense of purpose these days that I have never witnessed before in my entire career. And I would say, let's learn from and build on this unique spirit of solidarity in the future. Uh, we have much to gain and thank you very much. Stefan, thank you very much for your 
very inspiring remarks uh, about what you're doing at Merck, and we'll uh, be able to go into a bit more depth when we turn to the Q&A session. I'd like to introduce now uh, Ashley Grice. She's Chief Executive of Bright House Consulting, which is a BCG company, and she'll be casting light on uh, her thinking around purpose, and in particular, why all of this really matters. Thank you, Hitan. So for someone who's been part of the purpose movement back since 2003, when the topic caused blank stares and confusion, a forum like this is immensely satisfying. So thank you to the British Academy for asking me to comment today on why does this matter and what US companies need to do when it comes to purpose. And I hate to give what seems to be a $100 response to a million dollar question, but my answer is a simple one. First, companies need to articulate an authentic purpose, and then they need to do something about it by making bold commitments. Like Stefan said earlier, you have to walk the talk. Bright House's founder, Joey Ryman, a pioneer in the field of purpose, always said, without action, purpose is a parchment. Leaning into purpose in times of immense change is critical because our DNA dictates the role in the world we're meant to play. It clarifies the impact we aspire to have and the future that we want to see. Now, you all well know that purpose is an unchanging North Star that focuses strategy and culture and brand and guides smart business decisions. So you must also know that while purpose is grounded in an organization's history, its intentions are in the future. Now, I find that intriguing, that being a leader today requires that one moonlight is a futurist. It's not surprising, then, that purpose plays a central role in the organization of the future, what my BCG colleagues and I like to call the bionic company. Bionic companies are ones that combine the capabilities of humans and AI to create superior experiences, insightful customer relationships, and more productive operations. And purpose and strategy reside together in the heart of bionic companies. Yet as companies move toward bionic operations, employees will sense grand change. And we all know that change can be incredibly disorienting. And at the same time, we are becoming bionic. US companies are grappling with shifting environments uncertain public health, profoundly uncomfortable truths about racial injustice in our country. Businesses are uniquely capable of contributing to solutions to these issues of our time with global perspective and access to technology and resources and bottom-up collaboration. And often they're more effective than governments who can be hamstrung by polarization or debt or a focus on national borders. We need US businesses to adopt actionable purpose because we're going to need innovation to make real change. We're going to need to tap deeply into our humanity to find a path forward. In order to harness the impact a bionic company brings, we must unlock its potential through purpose. As it is, bionic potential comes in several varieties. The first is human potential. Purpose inspires employees and unlocks their discretionary effort, enabling innovative thinking and productivity and that holy grail, creativity. One's organizational potential comes by way of a North Star in the midst of change, Purpose aligns the organization so all employees, whether they sit in a corner office or by the coffee maker, can act independently in their roles to drive business performance. Purpose also unleashes ecosystem potential. It deepens relationships with multi-stakeholders and clarifies the organization's role in the broader context. Here, Purpose takes a cue from Mother Nature, she who invented the coral reef, and helps companies and leaders and citizens act in symbiotic ways. Finally, purpose maximizes societal potential. It connects timely TSI with a timeless reason for being, and not at the expense of profit, but in a dynamic where societal potential and organizational potential go hand in hand. So you have all of this potential materializing, it's accumulating, the conference room is filling up with boxes of potential. What now? How do you actualize it? To transform potential to action takes a battle plan with just four steps. They are recognize opportunity, Create conviction, choose bravery, and reimagine your success. So in order to make meaningful, purpose-driven change, you must first recognize the opportunity you have in getting back to your ethotic core. You have to look inward to expand outward. When Bright House articulated Delta Airlines' purpose in 2007, as part of a larger corporate transformation, we took inspiration from their founder, C.E. Woolman's mantra, hospitality from the heart. And Delta then applied that to both internal cultural practices and investments, as well as external customer service initiatives. In Delta's case, the company's ethos and its spirit were the inspiration for the unique role it could play in the world, elevation. The second step has to do with behavioral change. Companies must create conviction 
by bringing not only their management along, but by giving all their stakeholders a reason to believe in the purpose journey. Now, we all know the story about the NASA janitor who, when asked, said his job was not about cleanliness, but about putting a man on the moon. That is conviction. That is the best rocket fuel there is. Once you're properly inspired, leaders then need to make the brave decision to consider purpose as an input to strategy and operations and actually use it as an edit point on decisions for partnerships, for investments, for branding. The point of purpose is to go where it points you. CVS, a drugstore chain in the US, made a brave decision to become a healthcare company and stop selling cigarettes in their stores as they help people on the path to better health. A brave action, an initial $2 billion estimated hit, but an overall growth and success story, a hero story, which gets us to the fourth step, which is redefining success. No one likes to lose $2 billion. Yet by focusing on new metrics of what it meant to be a healthcare company and the bottom line, over time, CVS gained a lot more than it lost. It gained money and a prominent role in a movement. Following suit, US companies must relook at how they measure themselves and each other to include, yes, shareholder return and customer satisfaction, but also other measures like sustainability, diversity, equity, inclusion, and employee love. That is stakeholder capitalism at its finest. So recognition, conviction, bravery, redefinition. Embark on a course that, that does these four things and you can take action and see change. Without these steps, purpose is nothing more than a board statement a press release, or a poster in the break room. And it can't serve a bionic company because digital improvisation is just ones and zeros without humanity. It is not enough just to have purpose if you don't practice it and practice it well. You won't retain talent. You won't be innovative. You won't be at your best, which is where US companies by the nature of our national character believe they should be. Purposeful companies are companies with bold commitments, promises, that show how you intend to act on your purpose to solve a specific need. When Mercedes-Benz articulated its purpose, first move the world, it activated this purpose along with a bold commitment to be carbon neutral in German plants by 2022, a direct action stemming from its first mover role in the world. The Bank of Montreal committed to doubling the bank's mobilization for sustainable finance to 400 billion to deeply live its purpose of boldly growing the good. As I take it all in these days to US companies right now, I ask, what is your bold commitment when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion? And I didn't ask about your benchmarks. And I didn't say commitment. I said bold commitment. Simply put, purpose helps companies grow people and profit and social impact through authentic and bold commitments to action. And at this time, as we sit in the maelstrom of COVID-19, Black Lives Matter, climate change, US companies need to act. This is our moment to make meaningful impact. This is not the time for empty statements. This is a time to harness the eloquence of technology and the raw power and potential of humanity that we see protesting in the streets. So recognize your need, see conviction, be brave, find ways to redefine your victories to better align with your potential and then maximize and measure the heck out of it. Human beings are wired to seek meaning. It's in our DNA. It's why there's cave paintings, the Parthenon, and podcasts about everything, including cave paintings in the Parthenon. By engaging people with purpose, you satisfy that longing to be part of something bigger. You inspire a word that in Middle English meant to breathe life into. You release that small but precious extra effort that makes great things possible, that forces action, that lifts us all up with bionic strength. That effort is what changes the world, one country, one company, one bold commitment at a time. Thank you. Ashley, thank you very much. Uh, and the focus on bold commitments, I think, is a really exciting one. And I think your point about metrics is a crucial one. Uh, and I hope we'll hear more uh, from our next speaker who's going to be thinking, talking to us about how to actually embed uh, this agenda. So this is uh, Alan Jope, who's the chief executive of Unilever, <clears throat> who's had a lot of experience of uh, trying to embed purpose into a, into a global company. So Alan, could you tell us more? So Luke, thanks uh, very much for having me on. I think it's probably fair to assume from the fact that we've all been in invited to join you today, that uh, everyone on the panel is supportive of companies having a purpose that goes beyond uh, the traditional financial metrics and shareholder privacy. 
And I guess we all probably agree that businesses operating our multi-stakeholder models against long-term and more diverse metrics than just profit uh, and cash are more likely to prosper. And we all probably understand that the issue goes much further, that businesses, companies that operate without a sense of purpose can run the risk of foundering on the rocks of moral bankruptcy because society is definitely changing and companies that don't change with it will not survive or bounce back from crisis and that is the same whether it's a financial crisis a biological crisis a social justice crisis or the huge looming economic crisis that we all uh, with 100 percent certainty face Unilever has been around now for over 100 years, humbly making our soap, our soup and uh, our ice cream. Purpose was reflected in the founding mission of our firm from the, ninth, from the 1880s uh, to make cleanliness commonplace and lessen the load on women. That was what was stated uh, by our founders back in, uh, I guess, 140 odd years ago. Uh, today, we express our purpose as being to make sustainable living commonplace. And we believe that we've got both the opportunity and the responsibility to use Unilever's skill for good. Now, of course, uh, we have to deliver great brands, great products to people at a, a very fair price. But we believe we have to go beyond that, that we have to improve livelihoods uh, and we have to protect, protect and regenerate the environment. Unilever's purpose is built on three core beliefs, that brands with purpose grow, that companies with purpose last, and that people with purpose thrive. And let me just say a word on each of them. First, brands with purpose grow. We've now got several years of evidence that brands which are purposeful grow faster, actually a lot faster. But what brands say is increasingly irrelevant. People judge brands now much more on what they do. So Lifebuoy antibacterial soap, to pick a topical example, can only talk about saving the lives of children under the age of five because the brand has taught proper hand washing to almost a billion people now. Our biggest brand in the company, Dove, can only talk about helping to redefine beauty and build uh, young people's self-esteem because we've taught 35 million girls in face-to-face, one-hour classes, that are shown to change attitudes on body image. And Domestus can only campaign credibly for decent sanitation because the brand has helped to install over 20 million toilets in less well-developed countries. So we believe that authenticity is the most valuable currency for brands today. Our second belief, companies with purpose last, At the risk of stating the obvious, it's not purpose or profits. Frankly, I'm sick of answering that question. It's purpose as a pathway to superior financial performance. We're learning that a multi-stakeholder business model where we first and unapologetically look after our own employees, then our customers, by taking care of our business partners, taking care of the societies that we operate in, and of course the planet, only then will our shareholders be well rewarded. Value creation for all stakeholders drives growth. It reduces risk, it increases trust, and it's certainly a magnet for especially young talent. And speaking of which, our third belief that people with purpose thrive. Purposeful companies are made up of purposeful people, and we find that our company purpose is a source of pride and motivation for most members of our team. If you like, it's the glue for our company's culture. And we can quite tangibly measure the strength and engagement that allowing people to express their purpose at work creates. In fact, 92% of our team who can who say that they can live their purpose at Unilever also say they're inspired to go the extra mile. For any business, purpose must be authentic. It must drive your business's performance. I know Colin really believes in that. And it should not be a bolt-on, an apology or a PR exercise. Please 
companies avoid woke washing. You will get busted. So looking to today's reality and to our company, Unilever's future, if coronavirus has taught us anything, it's taught us that we need to return to a new normal, a new normal where we use the power of business to help tackle the big challenges that the world faces. And we think that two challenges are superordinate. In other words, the small problems we have typically derive from these two big problems. And they are one, inequality in all its forms, and two, climate change and the corresponding problems that derive from that. Of course, inequality and uh, climate change are so ov overwhelming that they will require partnerships that cut across sectors and cut across geographies if we're going to make a dent in them. But business can unilaterally embrace multi-stakeholder business models with purpose at the heart. Business leaders can recognize that business has to serve society and be a force for good. And business can take responsibility for shaping a new form of capitalism uh, before it's thrust upon us. So thanks, Heaton. Uh, we welcome this work of the Academy. I've always wanted to thank the Academy. Now's my chance. Uh, and I look forward to continuing the dialogue. Thanks very much. Alan, thanks so much for those remarks. And uh, now I'd like to turn to uh, Annalise Dodds MP, who's the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, who will be able to give us a wider view on what's the policy landscape and the politics that might support purposeful business. Uh, Annalise, delighted to have you here with us today. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Well, thank you very much indeed, Hitan. It's so lovely to be here. I'm really pleased that we can all see each other now. And I suppose the first thing I wanted to say actually was to thank the technicians because my goodness, I'm sure all of us on the panel are doing so many of these events, but in my case, without having the foggiest clue how all of it is organized. So thank you very much for fixing it for us. And of course, many thanks to the British Academy for this very, very important programme of work. And of course, we're coming to talk about it at the end of an enormous amount of research, which is still going to be uh, built upon into the future. Um, I suppose I wanted to just reflect on, on a few elements of this agenda, thinking about where we are now. And of course, we have had a huge amount of disruption um, uh, socially, economically, in so many other ways because of the current crisis. And I think it does give us the chance to focus really on some of the, the very important elements uh, which are the context for purposeful business. Um, first of all, the social contract between governments and, and peoples and business. Um, also how that um, social purpose of many businesses has become much more visible, I think, during the current crisis. How this links to debates about the social purpose of work as well. And then finally, maybe uh, some of the challenges around this and particularly some of the questions around coordination, which I think we do need to perhaps talk about a bit more. Um, it's very clear, and in fact, a number of the different speakers have alluded to this, that this has been a, a discussion within uh, many businesses for a long time around the role of, uh, of purpose, whatever we uh, wish to call it, you know, all the debates around ESG, um, stakeholder capitalism, you know, this is not something new, but arguably the intensity of those discussions is much deeper now. Um, and I think that um, Ashley was very right when she said that really now is the, is the time for change. Um, but I also would, would agree with, with what was just said um, as well about the, the critical nature of purpose for satisfaction as well, for job satisfaction, making sure that we, we focus on that. Really now, I think it's a time to crystallise a lot of the debates that have been bubbling um, along so that as uh, indeed the Academy has suggested, business really can be about solving problems um, and not creating them. Um, uh, and a situation where employees and consumers and other stakeholders can be thriving along with businesses. Um, so first of all, as I said, I, I think that this crisis in many ways 
has revealed the social purpose of many businesses. Obviously, a lot of what I comment on will be relatively UK specific, but I'm sure this is happening in other countries as well. Um, you know, I'm uh, speaking to you sat in Oxford uh, on a council estate in Oxford, um, and I know how the private sector, just as with the public sector, has been very, very strongly involved in the community response that's occurred. You know, local pub that's delivered 500 meals to different people, huge numbers of different businesses that have engaged with their communities in order to help particularly the most vulnerable in society. You know, very often when we have a salary backfill scheme in the UK, we've seen staff who have been furloughed then volunteering to help in different initiatives. And of course, we've also seen in the in manufacturing sectors, certainly in the UK, a repurposing of production processes to create essential material for the health effort. So in the UK, we've had so-called ventilator challenge. Um, again, it's a factory just down the road from me where I'm talking to you now, um, which produces uh, every mini, uh, every mini car in Europe. Um, and they worked with others around the so-called ventilator challenge. Um, but I think in many cases, really that very visible social purpose is just uh, in a sense, a clearer demonstration of what so many businesses were doing already. You know, they're not separate from society. They are part of it. And it's often those very locally rooted businesses that have the strongest customer support and the strongest levels of workforce satisfaction as well. I think where we're getting into a uh, more interesting debate around some of this, of course, is where public support and public funding has been put in to business and where there are stronger calls as a result of that from populations for the social purpose of business to be demonstrated. Um, so for example, there is a debate in, in the UK around whether there should be conditions on public support, particularly whether there should be conditions around bailouts. We've seen that occurring in Denmark. We've seen it occurring in France as well, to an extent around aviation. And indeed, we've seen business itself calling for that in the UK and in other countries particularly around so-called green strings, so requiring environmental conditions on the use of public funding. Um, the way that I look at all of this is that ultimately, you know, we really hope that certainly the population in the UK, but in other countries as well, will be able to look back on the support that's been provided to business, hopefully with pride rather than through gritted teeth. And I think that does mean that those kinds of uh, conditions may well be necessary. As I said, I think the current circumstances are also making us reflect on the purpose of work as well as the purpose of business um, and what work is good work, what work is on the contrary drudgery um, uh, and not fulfilling. Um, and perhaps during this crisis, we're seeing activities like logistics, for example, um, traditionally relatively low status forms of work. Um, uh, you know, obviously uh, in social care, retail, other areas, what many commentators are called the foundational economy, being given uh, a much higher valuation uh, by the public and by politicians. And I think that really is going to be critical for this agenda moving forward, because I think so often when we, we talk about these issues, there's a focus on, you know, the major manufacturers, much bigger companies, which are, um, you know, foundational economy, which is delivering social purpose very, very directly, but not necessarily valued for doing so. Um, and then just finally, I think that as we, we recognise the role of business to, as the Academy has put it, to profitably solve the problems of people and planet and not profit from creating problems, I think we need to think through, you know, what, what are the preconditions here. Um, I mean, I very much take on, on board what Ashley said about, you know, in, in many cases, and, you know, this, this would be the case if we're talking about um, very fragile states, for example, that companies might operate in, that, you know, the public sector might not be able to provide that framework. But in other contexts, you know, we're not just talking about kind of stakeholder engagement in companies, we're talking about stakeholders interrelating with business, with trade unions, with charities, with different public organizations at different levels in order to deliver a social purpose. You know, again, we've seen that around um, some of the mobilization for this crisis. I talked about it before, ventilator challenge in the UK, that wasn't just business, it was also trade unions, um, very often business organizations as well, working with central government 
we need to think through what the conditions are to deliver that social purpose. And I think especially for the green transition, the creation of a circular economy, you know, large scale uh, development of hydrogen power, all the other changes that need to occur, that coordination will be really very, very important. But look, I'm really, really excited about this conversation. I think it's brilliant that we're having it and it'll be interesting to, to hear the debate to the extent we're able to still have it in the time that we've got left. So big thanks, Heaton, and to the Academy as well. Thank you so much. So uh, we've got a limited amount of time left, about a quarter of an hour for some Q&A, and we've been having questions uh, come in through uh, the Slido function. Uh, let me start by asking each uh, uh, member of the panel uh, one of the questions uh, that's come through, or uh, I'll try to cluster them where I can. Uh, Stefan, I might begin with you. Uh, we've got a, a couple of people asking about what, does the purpose agenda mean in practical terms for boards and how do boards put purpose at the heart of their decision making? In practical terms it means that uh, boards need to define values and a mission and need to define uh, a, a, an incentive and reward scheme for senior management that is very much based on these, uh, uh, on these principles. Uh, by, by, by the way, I'm not claiming that we would be a morally superior company or anything. Uh, we are by no, means, by no means perfect. And whatever I say is just that we are trying hard uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, live these, uh, to live these principles. Uh, I've, I've personally experienced several discussions at board level and with uh, uh, colleagues at any levels of the organization where people ask the question like, uh, so if we have to decide between profit and purpose, what do we do? And I usually respond, give me a concrete example. Because I haven't seen, I think it's a false dichotomy. It's a question of being short-term or long-term uh, oriented, not a question of being profit-oriented uh, or not. An organization like ours could not have survived for 353 years had we not made had we not made, not made uh, profits, we couldn't invest about two billion euro a year into R and D if we wouldn't make if we wouldn't make uh, wouldn't make profits. I've seen at the at the sort of the micro level sometimes when when groups come to me or to the board for decisions, where one actually has to give guidance very, very clearly because there there is a there is a, a situation where one has to choose. I'll give you an example the active use of biomarkers in oncology drug development. If you use biomarkers, that means you have some sort of measure, biological measure, to define whether a patient is particularly suitable or eligible, and will probably hopefully uh, uh, react um, more, have a, have a better response to a certain uh, treatment than, uh, uh, than others. That results in a um, reduction of the number of patients who would get treated, obviously. So, so a, a simple sort of commercial uh, approach to this would mean we do not support this. Many companies, mine included, have actually very actively supported this, and it has turned out that it is actually that is also commercially more successful because payers say yes, we see more value in that. Uh, in that therapy, if we, we don't need to treat 100% of patients, we only treat 20% of patients, we see higher, higher therapeutic effect. And I could give you many, many such examples. What I'm, last point I wanted to make is, I'm trying to, together with my team and our board, to steer our innovation, our innovation cap uh, cap capabilities into a direction of solving problems. For instance, when right now 10% of world energy, cons energy consumptions goes into IT, it's going to increase vastly. Now, uh, uh, doing doing a couple of searches on Google consumes as much energy as a, a family in Malawi would need to prepare dinner. Uh, so uh, the energy efficiency of uh, uh, of IT solutions is key to us. We're looking into uh, things that are actually initially used to look foreign toward us, like something that's called future meat, i.e., making meat not from animals but from cells in, in, in cell culture which has a a, a, a very very inter, very, very interesting uh, interesting potential and but again we're not doing this in order to 
transform ourselves into a charity, we're doing this to be profitable uh, eventually. So I think this is, uh, you know, acting on a purpose is a business strategy. Defining a purpose and acting on that is a business strategy that makes organizations more successful and it's not an impediment to profitability. Thanks, Stefan, very clear. Ashley, turning to you, uh, we've had some questions around how do we avoid purpose washing? So mm -hmm. companies sort of pretending that they're doing something, but uh, they're not really committed. It's a, it's a great question because I think it's one of the concerns that the more popular and ubiquitous that the concept of purpose becomes, um, that there is this threat that then trivializes it. The key is when you think about purpose, if you look at it from the um, aspect of what are your greatest strengths? as a corporation ethotically, what are you really good at doing? And then thinking about what the need in the world that you can apply those strengths to is, if you take the intersection of those two things, that gives you purpose, right? So it, it lies in your unique role in the world. In order to make sure you're not washing it or you're just making a statement, that's when you get into the bold commitments, right? So it's the idea of pushing your company to be something greater than it is, that, that tension between idealism versus realism and understanding how you impact um, your company by making actions to it. So that's the bold commitment statement. Put it down on paper, make it bold, make sure that you capitalize on your unique role to make substantive change. And if you act on that in a systematic way across people and culture, across strategy and operations, and across your brand, then you will ensure that those actions prevent you from being a purpose washer, so to speak. Great, thank you. Alan, turning to you, we have a number of questions around how to measure this damn thing. So. What's your advice around measuring purpose and embedding that into the company? Well, uh, we think that capitalism 2.0 is going to have to go way beyond measuring top line, bottom line, cash, uh, the traditional financial metrics. And the work is converging on a set of metrics that is around uh, your impact on employees, your impact on society, and your impact on the environment and the planet, as well as uh, financial metrics. And I think it really depends what your purpose is. So if your purpose is to improve the self-esteem of young girls, you better start measuring how many young girls you're improving the self-esteem of. If your purpose is to take plastic out of the environment, then you can easily measure your environmental and waste impact. So the, the metric should depend on the purpose. If it's not measurable, it's probably a pretty lousy purpose. And there's a high likelihood that it will uh, impact one of those uh, stakeholder groups. Um, I think, you know, tiptoeing here into something that is uh, uh, not an area that I would claim expertise, but if you look at the racial injustice outcry that's happening right now, um, words are cheap. All kinds of corporate executives are uh, issuing statements about standing in support of blah, blah, blah. Um, what, uh, what we're being uh, told is show us how you're contributing to uh, breaking down in income um, inequality in the black community. Show how, you're show how your sourcing policies are preferentially uh, supporting black business. Um, these are really easy things to measure. And I think that's when you start to get to the nub of whether you're acting uh, with purpose or not. Great, thank you. Colin, I'm going to turn to you if that's okay. Uh, so somebody's raised this issue about charities, social enterprises, and other sorts of organizations have been thinking about purpose in, uh, in a different way for a long time. And so what can business learn from that? And what are the opportunities for a kind of interaction between business and civil society on this agenda? Uh, there's a great deal that uh, business and charities can learn from each other. Uh, in particular, the notion of corporate purpose is one that puts the idea of solving problems at its heart. Uh, and that's very much in line then, with thinking the way in which charitable organizations operate. The difference is that there's a second part to this, and that is the one of creating profits from doing that. And that notion of doing it in a profitable fashion is a key distinguishing factor. But on the other hand, charities are now increasingly focused on what it is that makes them resilient going forward. Uh, and that idea then of them 
uh, delivering a financial benefit, uh, or at least a surplus, means that they are becoming increasingly business focused. So there is, if you like, a convergence between the way in which we're thinking about business in terms of creating solutions and the way in which we're thinking about charities as becoming much more financially viable and sustainable going forward. Thank you. Annalise, uh, final set of questions for you. And because uh, you're at the end, I'm going to ask you two. Uh, so one is, what do you see as the areas for policy consensus on this? I mean, there's always an incentive for each political party to be sort of dis differentiating itself and trying to come up with something different. But in the current UK political landscape, which let's face it, you know, the, this centre-right government has spent a lot of state money propping up the economy in a way that you wouldn't have predicted from ideology. It seems that there's a kind of interesting space appearing. So what, you know, what, what are the opportunities for consensus? And then secondly, we've talked a bit about metrics at the company level. How do you think we should be thinking about measuring our economy at the national level uh, to support this agenda? Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, around where there is consensus, um, I, I would say very often it would be in areas where um, there isn't viewed as being a, a spectrum of government engagement. Um, so actually, I think there are partisan differences over, for example, conditionality being applied to the use of public funds where, you know, Labour Party is more in favour of it, particularly with relation to, to any bailouts and, and, you know, haven't seen a, a move on that from the Conservative side. Where I think there is agreement, as I said, is where there's not necessarily that, that spectrum there, where there's something that, you know, everybody agrees with. I would say that's the case indeed around reporting actually, where you know, there's general agreement that um, you know, it should be possible for investors, um, you know, it, both in stock markets, but much more broadly beyond listed companies as well, to be able to assess, for example, carbon performance over time of different companies, where we, we don't have clear metrics that are used very consistently, also around you know, the other kind of issues that Alan was talking about, actually around kind of um, uh, treatment of workforces, et cetera. You know, we, we don't yet have those, those clear systems. Um, and I think there is general agreement that, that we need to have that, you know, not in a heavy handed way, but stripping away some of the competition between different reporting mechanisms that exist. I also think there's an emerging consensus around the role of audit um, when it comes to some of what we've been talking about, you know, lots of pressure to reform auditing. Um, lots of auditors feeling a bit hard done by because they feel like they're being asked to comment on things that they're not currently legislatively allowed to comment on, at least in the UK context. Um, and I think that they certainly would be keen to get into some more of these kind of long term sustainability issues, I suppose, um, if they had a legal basis to do so. So I think there's agreement there. Um, and then uh, around how we, we measure the economy more broadly. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion around this. Um, I had a, an interesting discussion with Professor Richard Layard, of course, who's done a lot of work around well-being in general and how we can start to consider that more within government decisions. You know, there's governments like Australia, which are already doing that. Interestingly, the Welsh government as well, looking at that quite a bit. Um, but for me, really, the key is what, what was just referred to a moment ago around having a, a long-term focus so, you know, we, we often say, and you know, kind of politicians often say in all parts of the political spectrum, we want to have a long term focus. But, you know, we have so-called whole of government accounts in the UK that are meant to represent long term liabilities um, uh, and, the, you know, the impact of long term investment. How often do we really, really view that as the critical document as compared to more short term considerations? You know, surely we need to have that longer term perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, well, look, I'm sorry, we're going to have to wrap it up there. There's so much more we could discuss. Uh, for those of you who are tuning in, uh, don't just switch off yet. I'm pleased to say Colin Mayer is going to stay on uh, the screen for another quarter of an hour or so and pick up some of the Q&A that uh, ha have not been picked up so far. Uh, questions will also be uh, put into our LinkedIn group and uh, some of our speakers and others will be uh, answering those there. So you can look that up. Uh, let, let me just remind you that uh, this is the first in a series of um, uh, uh, conference events and you can tune in tomorrow uh, for our next one, which is about the role of stakeholders and you can use the same link to access that. I'm sorry that we've had some transmission issues today. You may have missed out on some of the first elements of the talks, but you, we will be putting the video online 
uh, and all of the sound will be uh, of high quality on that. Let me just uh, now uh, wrap up by thanking our wonderful speakers, uh, all of the people behind the scenes who've helped make this happen, uh, including the technicians, uh, the British Academy staff and the scribes. Uh, and finally, thank you, the audience. Thank you so much. So thank you very much for staying on to uh, address some of the questions. We've already had a very good discussion a lot around a lot of issues. Um, but I want to pick up on some of the others that uh, have been raised and try to address them as best I can. Uh, a number of you raised questions around the difference between a purpose statement, a mission statement, vision statement, etc. Uh, and let me be clear that a, a purpose statement is the reason why a company exists, what it's there to do, why it's created, it's raison d'etre. It differs from a mission statement, is a, which is about what a company does, and a vision statement, which is what it aspires to be, become. Uh, it's something that should be precise. It's about what companies a business is solving, for whom, uh, and when it's going to solve them, how it's going to solve them, and why that company is particularly well suited to solving them. So, so that notion of purpose is very fundamental. It underpins everything else that it should be doing. Uh, there's a question about uh, should corporations be required to state their purpose as part of a, an explicit social contract? Uh, the answer to that is in some cases, yes. Uh, it needs to be linked into in particular in the cases of uh, public companies, companies performing a social function, uh, that those have, a, have an important uh, social duty to perform. And their linking in the purpose to that social license is a very important one. Elsewhere, what one wants to do is to encourage as many purposes as possible. One wants to encourage a multiplicity of company purposes and as much competition between them. So that one doesn't want to try and specify or regulate uh, purposes. Uh, and in those cases where companies are regulated, what one wants to do is to in particular ensure that their purposes are aligned with their social licenses to operate. There's a question that uh, talks about uh, what role one we see for international standards in terms of uh, setting the guidelines for purposeful businesses, in particular multinational enterprises. There is a need for international harmonization around these some of the standards that are being applied. Uh, as Ellen Job said in uh, response to a question about measurement, it's really for a company to define uh, what its purpose is. But uh, there is uh, a need in some areas to harmonize where in particular, the types of problems that we're expecting all companies to address are, are similar. So for example, in the relation to the environment, uh, where, for example, we could have harmonization around CO2 emissions, or it may be in relation to providing measures of the levels of inequality uh, within firms in terms of differentials between uh, top and medium salaries in an organization. So there are some areas where one can achieve uh, a degree of uh, harmonization of measures and standards. There's a question about uh, what role government should play to enable, to provide an enabling environment for business to adopt and implement a social purpose. There are a number of respects in which governments can assist with this, one of which is in terms of uh, the law and whether or not the law is sufficiently well aligned with delivery of company purposes. So uh, at the moment, the view is that the law is quite permissive in allowing companies to structure themselves in such a way as they think appropriate uh, and where they believe it appropriate to adopt a corporate purpose. But um, that 
may not be sufficient to really provide companies with the uh, assurance that if they do establish a purpose, that they can then commit to it. So one way in which that's been achieved is through the law uh, incorporating in the form of public benefit corporations, a statement that it's the duty of the board to uphold the company's purpose, as well as to be profitable and commercially successful. Uh, and, and that notion uh, of the purpose of a company then helps to reinforce the, the idea that purpose is at its heart. Uh, what, uh, how, how, how important is it that a company's purpose should be unique uh, and directly related to the products or the services that companies produce? A, a purpose does not have to be unique. It, it, it isn't necessarily the case that every company has to find a purpose that's different from every other purpose. But what a company should be thinking about is, is there anything uh, particularly different about the, the problems that it's going to try and solve? So it may be that they're doing it on a more regional basis in relation to a particular set of customers, consumers, or, or, or societies, um, as against doing it on a global basis. But whatever the, the, the factor is, there has to be a clarity on the part of the company as to what problems it's solving, whose problems it's solving, um, and why it's particularly well suited to solving those problems. So provided that uh, a company is clear on those points, there's no particular need for it to necessarily be one that is different from any other uh, purpose. And uh, there's a question about what incentives or penalties should the government provide for companies to address large social issues? Um, how about removing investment obstacles? That's a very important part in terms of thinking about the role that government can play, namely that it should uh, try to ensure that there is an alignment between public policy and the promotion of corporate purposes, that regulations that are put in place do not obstruct companies in pursuing their purposes. Uh, so, for example, a set of regulations that is sometimes thought to potentially do that relate to the way in which companies can structure their ownership. Um, and whether or not they can really try to ensure that those who are most committed to a long-term purpose for companies are the, the ones that uh, are really able to uh, uh, steer the purpose, define the purpose and implement the purpose in the business. And perhaps I'll just take um, uh, one other uh, question before we close this. Is purpose the answer to the questions, why does the business exist? And what do, the, what, what do we do that creates values for customers, employees, and suppliers? So uh, the, the, the answer is yes. That it, it clearly is uh, about creating values for customers, employees, and suppliers in the sense that by solving problems, uh, it enhances the ability of customers, employees, and suppliers to achieve what they are seeking to do. In, in essence, you can think about purpose is, as a mechanism by which uh, a company is assisting others in delivering on their purposes. So it is creating uh, benefits for those other parties. It's enhancing their values, not necessarily their value in a financial sense, but certainly in the sense of giving them a greater sense of, for example, in relation to employees, a greater sense of fulfillment and meaning to the work that they're doing. So I think uh, that there are the, a, a lot of other questions that I haven't been able to address, but I think that gives you a flavor of the very rich set of questions that we've had coming in, and some of which I expect uh, you'll find being answered in subsequent sessions 
of this summit. So thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, and look forward to uh, your participation in the coming summits. Thank you very much indeed.